action. Hi guys, I'm Brittany. I'm Christian. I'm Nathan. And I'm Erica. Um, we did our project on do aliens and UFOs exist? And my question to you is how many of you believe in the possibility that aliens or UFOs exist? Um, there's an average of 70,000 UFO sightings a year worldwide, so that means there's 196 a day. In the United States, one in five people believe in aliens, and one in seven know someone or have themselves encountered um, aliens or seen UFOs. In the Bible, it states that there's, that in the Bible, it was the first documented encounter with aliens, and in 1883, it was the first photo of UFOs. Uh, life in our galaxy. It's kind of hard to believe that aliens wouldn't be possible because there's 100 billion planets and 20 billion planets are Earth-like. Um, also, there's seven um, near collisions with aircrafts on Earth with UFOs or some type of like spacecraft um, that people see on a daily basis. Also, in 2004, um, it was found that Mars had just as much methane gas as Earth, and methane, methane gas is typically only created by living organisms. So we're going to tell you a couple stories and first-hand accounts of UFOs throughout the world. Dating back to 1966 was when the first UFO encountered for the Reed brothers was experienced 700 yards away from their home in Sheffield, Massachusetts. It was reported that they had seen what looked like a young, frail human with some characteristics that might, that might reference to odd-looking human beings. A year later, their second encounter occurred where the Reed brothers found themselves in the spaceship for an undetermined time of two seconds to 20 minutes. Three years after their first encounter, they had another one, their third one, in fact, that was again in Sheffield, Massachusetts, where the Reed family in 1969 reported that they were coming back from Ashley Falls on Route 7 when a light change of pressure and silence was amongst them, and their son Thomas, the oldest, was no longer in the car and was looking, it was from above, which looked like a human, a huge hangar. Each of the four family members recalled being in a different section of of the spacecraft before the family members inexplicably ended up in the car. However, this time, Thomas reports that his mother was now in the passenger seat rather than the driver's seat, and at least 40 people saw the spacecraft and had made reports. The last alien report encountered by the Reed family came from Matt Reed when he was living in Brownsburg, Indiana, as he was driving home. Again, lights appeared, and he explicitly found himself in a spacecraft where everything was glowing. He recalled seeing three different types of aliens that night, a reptilian, an alien that resembled kind commonly seen in pop culture, and a large one with, an, with elephant skin. All of the reeds shared the same RH negative blood group, which they like to correlate to their alien experiences. Howard Reed, the father, who was also a select board member of Canon New York, died on October 2nd. In 2006, years after the 14 years after the first case was heard, the Reed family claims that they have been studied by several organizations, including the MUFON, which is the Mutual UFO Network. In 2010, Thomas took a polygraph test in his home in Knoxville, Tennessee. He was questioned about the 1966 incident, and he answered truthfully according to the polygraph document. So I'm just going to tell you guys a few stories from different NASA employees and former astronauts who have encountered UFOs firsthand. The first is Joseph A. Walker, who in April of 1962 was on a flight and recorded five UFOs. He sent those recordings in to his higher-ups and they were never released to the public or really seen again. The next is a man called Don Dickey Slayton, who was a former USSR astronaut and a former NASA astronaut. Deakey uh, Slayton was testing a P-51 fighter in Minnesota when he spotted what he thought originally was a kite, but he realized that he was 10,000 feet near and there's no way there was a kite there. As he got closer to it, 
he saw that it actually wasn't kite shaped and he described it as a saucer disc like object. So he started trailing the object when he realized that it was slowly pulling away from him even though he was going 300 miles an hour at top speed. So then he noticed that the saucer took a 45 degree angle upwards and he described that it basically shot into the sky and disappeared pretty much instantly. So he reported this information to his higher ups and he never received anything back from him. He was never really spoken of again. Now we all know about the Apollo 11 flight where Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin took their first steps on the moon, be the first two people to walk on the moon. During this, the filming of this, the radio actually got cut out for two minutes so you couldn't hear anything. Now NASA said that, that was because one of the cameras overheated and then they ended up fixing it. But there are a lot of different sources who say that that's not why the two minute warning, the two minute silence happened and because it was that Neil Armstrong was reporting seeing the UFOs on the moon that the government didn't want to get out. So Otto Binder, who was a former NASA employee during the two, Apollo 11 flight, and multiple ham radio operators who were receiving the, the radio transmission directly from Apollo 11 and not receiving it from NASA headquarters, reported hearing and intercepting the following message during the two minutes of silence. And that message was Mission Control reporting in saying, What's there? Mission Control calling Apollo 11. Or Apollo 11 answered, These babies are huge, sir, enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you, there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge, and they're on the moon watching us. Maurice Chatelman, who in 1979 came out and spoke, was the former chief of NASA communications during the Apollo 11 flight. He was quoted saying in an interview that the encounter was common knowledge in NASA, but nobody has ever talked about it until now. Also during that interview, he was quoted saying that all Apollo and Gemini flights were followed, both at a distance and sometimes closely, by extraterrestrial space vehicles. Every time it occurred, the astronauts informed Mission Control, who then ordered them to be absolutely silent about it. And one quote from Neil Armstrong at the 25th anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing that is kind of sketchy is when he said this, there are great ideas undiscovered, breakthroughs available to those who can remove one of truth's protective layers. Basically, subtly saying that not the whole truth has come out about the landing on the moon. One of the most credible humans to have reported UFO sighting is Major Gordon Cooper, a U.S. Air Force pilot and accomplished astronaut who was given an award for the Distinguished Service Medal by JFK. He saw UFOs twice. His first time was in Germany in 1951 while he was in the Air Force. Him and a few other planes were flying and noticed what he described as at least a hundred UFO disc-like shaped things flying above them at speeds way higher well, at distances way higher than them, at speeds way faster than them. So they all saw this and they all reported it. And after they reported the, inf the, the incident, it was never officially explained and it was just nothing was ever brought up about it again. Again, in 1957, when Cooper was the project manager at the Edwards Air Force Base Test Center in California, he sent out a crew to film the construction of a new area of their base where they saw a saucer land, and three little legs came out, and it landed in the lake bed, the dried up lake bed. So as they were rolling film, and they went out, and they filmed what they saw, and as they got closer, the saucer realized they were there, and lifted up, tilted up, and shot into space. So his men came back to him with what told him what had happened, so he had them go roll the film, and make a, like print the film. This was 1957, so you could have just instantly made copies. And while they did that, he was on the phone with higher-ups in Washington, who, by the time the film was made, told him that he needed to give it to a car, put it in a carrier package, give it to one of their carriers that's on base, and that they were gonna take a base plane and head straight to Washington. He was reported not to make copies of it and to immediately give it to the courier. And Cooper and his men watched this film. He said they said it was a very good film of it. And once the film left, it was never heard from again once it got to Washington. Nothing's meant to happen was in Washington National Airport. We were shortly before midnight on July 19, 1952, 
Air traffic controllers picked up three UFOs on the radar screen over the next three and a half hours, and they would keep disappearing and reappearing on their radar scopes. They were visually corroborated by the incoming flight crews, so at three in the morning, Air Defense Command dispatched two fighter jets interceptors, which failed to make contact. The following weekend, the same scenario happened virtually identical to what had just already occurred. The targets were picked up on the radar and verified by both incoming pilots, and this time ground them. This time, the jets also made contact and had some. Uh, they picked them up on their scopes for a little while before they eventually lost contact. After this event, so many calls came into the Pentagon alone that his telephone service completely tied up with call related to UFOs and people's reports. So after all this commotion, they had the so-called Washington Wave. The military held its largest press conference since the end of World War II. Major General John Sandfield, Director of the Air Force Intelligence, and Major General Roger Rand, Chief of the Air Defense Command, had any of the surface that was and said the radar turns were just temperature inversions. So more come with the same answer. Um, just a quick fact about Egypt is that alien, um, alien suspicions date back to 5,000 years ago. They would find um, small little um, uh, drawings on the pyramids that look similar to UFOs. Um, Area 51 is a training and testing space located 100 miles north of Las Vegas. Um, it's also commonly known for being a place where the government holds all their secrets about aliens. Uh, rumors started when there was an alleged crash in 1947 in Roswell, New Mexico. Allegedly, a spacecraft flew into Roswell, New Mexico, and the, the entire crash scene was taken and brought to Area 51 along with a small alien. Um, the news report said that the spacecraft crashed into the what crashed into um, Roswell, and then hours later, the news came back on and said that it was a weather bubble. A weather bubble is this little thing that scientists use. They put helium inside of it, and they're able to measure um, weather streams. Uh, for years, map makers weren't even allowed to um, even put Area 51 on their maps. So it just goes to show how like sketchy Area 51 is. If you did work there, you had to sign an oath of secrecy. Um, and that oath of secrecy wasn't broken until 1989 when Robert Laser, uh, a former worker who also lived at Area 51, went on national news claiming he was part of an operation that dealt with alien technology and named in great detail many of the spacecrafts that he worked on that were for NASA to go um, in space, um, he was considered the first insider to like blow the whistle on the operation. Um, the government came back and said that all of, everything that he said was untrue, and they also used the fact that he said that he had a master's degree from um, Cali Tech, and it was found that he wasn't. His rebuttal was that he um, was trying to be erased from the world. So with all the current of these first-hand accounts from NASA employees, astronauts, and everyday people like you and me, it's very hard to discredit the possibility of extraterrestrial encounters in and around the planet. It's something that should be seriously investigated with an open mind, of course, of writing an opposition to a crazy man. So I leave it to you. Do you think we may be visited by creatures in our space?